In this video, I want to ask the question, was Napoleon Bonaparte a Muslim? Now, you might think, what a strange question, but actually in his own lifetime, some people thought he was. And in fact, he himself on certain occasions suggested that he was. So it's not an absurd question. But was he really a Muslim? Because many people think he wasn't. And I'll look at the historical evidence and then I'll come to a conclusion at the end. And I think it's possible to come to an unequivocal conclusion about whether or not he was. The evidence is uh, very clear. Now, this question, I think, is a very timely question because there's a new movie coming out called Napoleon. And I've seen the advertising. It says he came from nothing. He conquered everything. And this is a, a film coming out, I think, in uh, November. Uh, the director is Ridley Scott, and he's done many brilliant films. And it promises to be an extraordinary uh, look at this military commander's life. And Napoleon, is, as you know, uh, was not just a, a French general. He ended up being emperor of France. In fact, more than just France, he was emperor of Italy and even Spain for a brief while. And he went on conquering uh, country after country, ended up in Moscow. And anyway, he ended up being captured by the British and spent his last remaining uh, life in captivity. So the question is, was he actually a Muslim? And the key event, I think, that can answer this question is his reasons for invading Egypt and what he did when he was in Egypt, because he conquered that country. And um, looking at the historical evidence is fascinating. It gives us an insight not only into him, but into European attitudes towards Islam and especially the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, who, uh, who Napoleon clearly had a huge amount of admiration for. Now, I'm going to be reading from this a very interesting book called Faces of Muhammad, Western Perceptions of the Prophet of Islam from the Middle Ages to Today by a chap called uh, John Toland, who is a professor of history at a university in France. And he's actually, I think he's American. And God willing, I'll be um, interviewing him in a month or two um, about this new book, which I do highly recommend. Uh, and I've nearly, uh, nearly finished it and I will link to it in the description below so you can get your own copy. If you want to know about Western perceptions and, and misunderstandings about the Prophet Muhammad upon Behebs, this is the book. He's probably the leading expert in the West on the West's perception of the Prophet Muhammad over the centuries, going right back to the uh, 7th and 8th century up to the 21st um, century. And it, you wouldn't believe uh, what the mainstream views about the Prophet Muhammad were until relatively recently. They're quite unbelievable and shocking, such as the misinformation and lies that were swirling around the West. That's a different story. God willing, we'll be dealing with that in, in a month or two. In the meantime, the question is, was Napoleon Bonaparte a Muslim? And I want to give you the backstory on this. And this is the latest academic research uh, based on top uh, evidence. In chapter seven of this uh, fantastic book, Faces of Muhammad, <clears throat> and I don't think Professor Turlin is uh, a Muslim at all, but he writes the following. And um, he mentions the word Muhammad a lot. Please supply peace be upon him in your own minds. I'm not going to repeat peace be upon him every time the word Muhammad is read, uh, mentioned here. I'm just going to read the script of the book as, as it is. Um, we can supply as Muslims peace be upon him uh, quietly to ourselves if we wish. Anyway, uh, Professor Tolan writes, Napoleon Bonaparte, in a mixture of real admiration and calculated interest, made the prophet into something of a role model, casting himself as a new world conqueror and legislator walking in Muhammad's footsteps. Napoleon was a 20 year old soldier in 1789. And that was a year, of course, of the French Revolution. And he quickly embraced the revolution, subsequently distinguishing himself by squelching a royalist revolt in a battle in 1795. He was then made general of the army of Italy, which he led to decisive victories over the Habsburgs and their allies. When a large force mustered under his command in Toulon in May 1798, its destination was secret. Toulon is a, 
a city on the south coast of France, of course. Uh, perhaps Sicily or Sardinia, some speculated. Perhaps Gibraltar, a strategic outpost of the British enemy. And after Gibraltar, maybe England itself. So what is the destination? Where is Napoleon going? But the destination was Egypt, to the surprise of many. Why take troops from Europe to the other end of the Mediterranean? In part, to thwart the English and their East India Company by occupying a country that had long been a hub of trade between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. Egypt would be a French India, an oriental source of power, prestige and wealth for the metropole, the metropole meaning France, of course. And who knows, perhaps one day it would serve as the base for a French slash Egyptian expedition against the British in India. The idea was not new. It had been aired and debated during the reign of Louis XVI. French Orientalists such as Volney had argued that the Egyptian masses would be grateful to be freed from the oppression of their Ottoman overlords and their Mamluk rulers. They would welcome a French expedition with open arms such as naivety here. By 1798, things had changed. Napoleon, along with members of the directorate that authorised the expedition, clearly sought, uh, also sought to export Republican values of the revolution into the Orient. Now, uh, I'm saying this, not this author. The Republican values, of course, are the French revolution's values of liberty, equality, fraternity. They're secular, quite militant secular values, anti-Catholic uh, values, anti-religious values, really. So Napoleon and others were seeking to export this into the Muslim world, into the Orient, quote unquote. They had learned, these people, uh, from their reading of many of the 18th century works we examined in chapter six, it's worth reading chapter six, by the way, that Muhammad had been a reformer, that he had preached a purified monotheism stripped of arcane rites, devoid of a priestly caste, where traditional French Catholicism was associated with oppressive monarchy Islam seemed a more egalitarian, republican religion. Surely the troops of the revolution come to free the Egyptians from the Ottomans would be welcomed as brothers. Yeah, surely. What's more for Napoleon, quote unquote, great reputations are only made in the Orient. Europe is too small. End quote. It's interesting, isn't it? For Napoleon, Europe's too small for him. He needs a bigger expanse. He needs the globe to move around in. Europe's too small, he says. The Islam that Napoleon and his troops encountered in Egypt did not, in fact, resemble that of the previous uh, Enlightenment writers and surveyed in this book. This is one of the factors that made the expedition fail. And one of the explanations for what seems with two centuries hindsight, in other words, from today, an adventure clearly destined to fail. In other words, Napoleon and his associates had completely unrealistic expectations about what Egyptian Islam, if I can use that expression, was actually really like. Our, our writer continues, in May 1798 then, Napoleon set off to conquer Egypt at the head of a fleet of some 55,000 men. In June, he captured Malta after a brief siege and continued towards Egypt. Now, this is all building up, by the way, to an explanation as to uh, his relationship, Napoleon's relation with Islam and whether or not he was a Muslim. This is the backstory, the historical context to understand what he did, why he did it, and whether or not he really was a Muslim. And I think we can say confidently whether or not he was today, but we'll come to that at the end, as I say. So here he is, he's setting off to conquer Egypt, hoping, and uh, with 55,000 men, which is a huge force at that time, hoping to gain the allegiance of the Egyptians and to convince them to throw off the yoke of their Ottoman empires. So he addressed the following missive, this declaration, this letter to the Egyptian 
people. And I'm now going to read to you the words of Napoleon himself, translated, of course, in French into English, um, addressed to the, uh, the Egyptian Muslims. So this is Napoleon's opening gambit to them. In the name, and notice the language he's using. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, there is no other God than God. He has neither son nor associate to his rule. So basically, he's quoting Quranic, like, Quranic sounding phrases. On behalf of the French Republic, founded on the basis of liberty and equality, the General Bonaparte, head of the French army, proclaims to the peoples of Egypt that for too long the Beys who rule Egypt insult the French nation and heap abuse on its merchants. The hour of their chastisement has come, says Napoleon. For too long, he says, this rabble of slaves bought up in the Caucasus and in Georgia tyrannizes the finest region of the world. Notice how Napoleon flatters the Egyptians, the finest region of the world. But God, the Lord of the worlds, all powerful, has proclaimed an end to their empire. Egyptians, he says, some will say that I have come to destroy your religion. This is a lie. Do not believe it. Tell them that I have come to restore your rights and to punish the usurpers that I respect more than do the Mamluks, God, his prophet Muhammad, and the glorious Quran. So he's boasting how much he respects God, the prophet Muhammad, and the Quran. Qadi, Sheikh, Shobagi, tell the people that we are true Muslims. Interesting. Are we not the one who has destroyed the Pope who preach war against the Muslims? Did we not destroy the Knights of Malta? These are crusaders type. Because these fanatics believe that God wanted them to make war against the Muslims? End quote. So here he explicitly identifies that we are true Muslims, says Napoleon. We meaning not just Mato uh, Napoleon, but the French Republic. We are all Muslims. Extraordinary. So um, the writer of this excellent volume, Face of Mohammed, Professor John Toler, says he's professor of history at a university in uh, France. He's a specialist in this very area that he is writing so fascinatingly about. Um, he continues, um, it would be easy to dismiss such rhetoric as cynical and self-serving. <laughs> this is the sober judgment of an historian two centuries later. Cynical, self-serving, says our author. Indeed, the following year, autumn 1799, as he prepared to leave Egypt, he left instructions to French administrators in Egypt, explaining, among, among other things, that, quote, one must take great care to persuade the Muslims that we love the Quran and that we venerate the prophet. One thoughtless word or action can destroy the work of many years, quote, unquote. So again, he's professing a great love for Islam, basically. And then our author continues a couple of pages later. From the books of Voltaire, Savary and others, Napoleon had understood that Islam was pure, simple monotheism. This vision, deployed as we have seen by 18th century authors, who were concerned principally with criticizing the prominence of the Catholic Church, showed little knowledge of Islam as it was practiced daily by millions of Muslims. In other words, there wasn't any real understanding of actual Islam. <clears throat> we have seen that for Edward Gibbon, Edward Gibbon is a very famous historian uh, in the 18th century. He wrote The Rise and Fall of uh, the, the rise and decline of the Roman Empire. For Gibbon, the prophet was a reformer and visionary, and Islam was essentially the equivalent of philosophical deism. Now, deism is the doctrine uh, that, yes, there is a God, he maybe created the universe, but he's essentially abstract. He doesn't get involved in the world. He basically creates the world and leaves it to get on and on its way so he doesn't send prophets he doesn't answer prayer he he's not involved in the human race in any imminent sense so he's a, a remote abstract deity and this kind of philosophical deism was very popular 
during uh, and after the French Revolution. And essentially um, that for Edward Gibbon, uh, Islam was essentially the equivalent of philosophical deism. Napoleon seems to have believed this as well. And this belief shaped his policy in Egypt. Indeed, may have been one of the factors in his decision to invade Egypt. The French, having dealt a blow to papist superstition, in other words, the superstitions of the Pope of the Catholic Church with their saints and their cults and their clergy, um, the French, it is said, were deists who expected to find kindred spirits in Egypt's Muslims. So they thought that Muslims were deists, which is obviously not true because Muslims believe that God very much is, has sent prophets, sent revelation, that he's closer to the believer than his jugular vein. There are lots of statements, obviously, in the Quran where God is very close to the believer and that God loves uh, the people who do good things, who do righteousness and so on. This is not deism. This is uh, the, the faith of you know, Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But anyway, that's a different subject. Um, our author continues, and if the French were true Muslim deists, Napoleon is the Corsican prophet, because Napoleon's from Corsica, of course, that's where he was born. One of the ladies of his court um, says that the emperor had told her that on his way to Egypt, quote, I was creating a religion. I saw myself leaving on an elephant on the way to Asia with a turban on my head and in my hand a new Al-Quran, as it was called, that I hear composed to my liking, end quote. This, of course, is courtly bandage, the emperor after the fact making light of his own ambitions. Yet it reveals a real identification confirmed by his own writings. As ruler of Egypt, Napoleon adopted the title of Al-Sultan Al-Kabir, the Great Sultan. You know, the, the arrogance there, almost like a, another pharaoh. He strove to convince Egyptians that he and the French, far from being Christian infidels, oh, no, 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 they weren't Christian infidels, were friendly to Islam. In August 1798 uh, was the traditional festival of the, the Maulid al-Nabi, is the birthday of the prophet. Cairo's Muslim leaders were in no mood to celebrate, presumably because they were occupied, obviously, by uh, the French. But Napoleon saw this as significant as a significant public relations opportunity. And he insisted on funding the festivities in which the twirling of near naked Sufi dervishes was mixed with the parade of French soldiers in full regalia, the chants of Muslims with the with the marital, sorry, the martial strains of the marching band. What a curious mixture. As one uh, French officer noted ironically, the French artillery saluted Mohammed. The Sultan Al Kabir, obviously the Napoleon, uh, regaled in Oriental costume, led the festivities and proclaimed himself protector of all religions. He was hailed as Ali Bonaparte. Ali Bonaparte, can you imagine? Anyway, to continue. So the question is uh, about Napoleon's feelings about Islam and was he a Muslim, of course. Napoleon sought, <laughs> I find this hard to read this paragraph, but I've got to read it. You, you make of it uh, as you will. Napoleon sought to persuade Cairo's Im imams that he and his troops were Muslims. And he requested that they say the traditional Friday prayer, the kutbah, in his honor. Now, of course, Muslims will know that under the caliphate, of course, the, the Friday prayer always mentioned the name of the ruler, the caliph, the imam. Because in Islam, the, the mainstream normative Sunni position is you must have a ruler, a single ruler, an imam in whose name the Friday prayer takes place. And Napoleon <laughs> requested that they say the, the prayer in his honor. Um, gosh, Sheikh Abdullah al-Shakari, uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah al-Shakari explained that they will be delighted to do so as soon as Napoleon and his troops converted to Islam. The general explained that he was ready to convert 
but that his soldiers were loath to be circumcised and were very fond of drinking wine. Could special dispensation be made for them? Could they be an exception? Could they carry on drinking lots of wine? Napoleon hoped to have himself and his troops recognized as Muslim and hence legitimate rulers of Egypt. The sheikhs prevaricated in order to avoid a diplomatic clash. If you imagine the dilemma they had, they didn't want to upset this new dictator, this new ruler of their country who has just usurped their country. They didn't want to upset them, so they kind of prevaricated and, you know... Um, but they didn't want to agree either, because clearly Napoleon, for them, you know, wasn't a Muslim. Again, the general seems to have thought that French Republican deists could be recognised as Muslims without any real knowledge of Islam. What an assumption, eh? This bookish deist vision of Islam perhaps explains some major diplomatic errors, which, when, for example... The French raised shrines to Sufi saints when they widened streets into boulevards. Raised shrines, meaning when they obliterated these Sufi shrines. Al-Shakari later wrote that the French were monotheistic philosophers who based their ideas on reason rather than accepting revelation. It's a really important insight. This, uh, this uh, Islamic uh, ulama uh, noted that uh, the French were monotheistic philosophers based on reason, but not on revelation. He faulted them for believing that Moses, Jesus and Muhammad were mere sages. In other words, kind of like spiritual geniuses rather than divinely ordained prophets, which is obviously exactly what the Quran teaches. God, the imam affirmed, sent the prophets and men should follow God's law, not that of human legislators. In other words, not that of the French. Ironically, Napoleon in practice largely ceded to this view, making Cairo's religious elite, this is the ulama, of course, into his indigenous administrative agents, giving them, in fact, more power than the Ottomans ever had. As Juan Cole quips, Juan Cole is an American historian who writes on uh, Islam, the French Jacobins who had taken over Notre Dame for the celebration of a cult of reason and who had invaded and subdued the Vatican were now creating in Egypt the world's first modern Islamic republic. <laughs> Extraordinary. Yet to their chagrin, and despite the alliance of a part of the Egyptian elite, so some of the Egyptian elite did go over to the French, but a lot didn't, clearly, hostility towards the French occupation remained strong. And the frequent revolts were brutally quelled by the French army. So despite Napoleon's overtures and, and mentions of friendliness and how he, he's a good leader and, and everything, if the, uh, the Egyptians resisted his uninvited military occupation of their country, uh, they were brutally suppressed. So this is the, the, the hand in the, you know, the, the iron fist in the velvet glove, as the, as the expression goes. In 1798, after one particularly violent rebellion and particularly bloody repression, Napoleon suggests his identification not only with the prophet, but also with the Mahdi. He identifies himself with the prophet and the Mahdi as he proclaims the formation of a new Diwan in the following terms. Now, I want to read this to you because these are the words again of Napoleon Bonaparte. And it's crucial to uh, understanding whether or not he was a Muslim. And if he wasn't, what was his agenda? How did he promote himself to the Muslim world, to the Egyptian Muslims? And Napoleon, obviously originally in French, but here in English translation, said to the Egyptians. And this is a quite extraordinary language. When I first read this, I thought, wow. So Napoleon said, tell your people that since the beginning of time, God has decreed the destruction of the enemies of Islam and the breaking of the crosses by my hand. Moreover, he has decreed from eternity that I shall come from the West to the land of Egypt for the purpose of destroying those who have acted tyrannically in it. 
and to carry out the tasks which he has set upon me. So, you know, God's will is centered on Napoleon. And no sensible man will doubt that all this is by virtue of God's decree and will. Also tell your people that many verses of the glorious Quran announce the occurrence of events which have occurred and indicate others which are to occur in the future. In other words, the Quran, he claims, is talking about events in his own lifetime, in Napoleon's life. Indeed, there are some who refrain from cursing me and showing me enmity out of fear of my weapons and great power. And they do not know that God sees the secret thoughts. He, and he quotes the Quran here, knoweth the deceitful of eye and what men's breasts conceal. Quran 40, 19. And those who bear such secret thoughts oppose the decisions of God and they are hypocrites. And the curse and affliction of God shall surely befall them, for God knoweth the secret things. Know also that it is in my power, boasts Bonaparte, to expose what is in the heart of every one of you. For I know the nature of man and what is concealed in his heart at the very moment I look upon him, even though I do not state or utter what he is hiding. So he has these supernatural powers to peer into people's hearts. However, a time and a day will come in which you will see for yourselves that whatever I have executed and decreed is indeed a divine decree and irrefutable. For no human effort, no matter how devoted, will prevent me from, carry out, from carrying out God's will, which he has decreed and fulfilled by my hand. Happy are those who hasten in unity and ardor to me with good intentions and purity of heart, end quote. <clears throat> so um, Professor Tolan, author of this extraordinary book, um, Faces of Muhammad, uh, continues on page 192. He says about this, what I've just read. Did Napoleon believe that such proclamations would have any effect on the, the Egyptian people? Or are they the deluded decrees of an increasingly desperate general. So uh, you can draw your own conclusions. In the following months, the French crushed further revolts in the Nile Delta, launched a failed expedition in Syria, and everywhere faced rebellious Egyptians and an alliance of Ottomans and British. The British are getting involved here now. Napoleon decided to leave. So he's had enough. In the ship that brought him from Alexandria, obviously in Egypt, to France, while his companions worried that they might be intercepted by the British Navy, Napoleon remained quiet, calm. Well, why does he remain calm? He stayed in his cabin, reading alternatively the Bible and the Quran. Interesting. So Napoleon, the great general, leaves Egypt and he's obsessed, focused on the Bible and the Quran. That's what preoccupies this great general's mind. Napoleon left uh, General Jean-Baptiste Kleber in charge of the French forces in Egypt. Kleber negotiated with the British uh, the Convention of Al El Arish in January 1800, by which the French gave up all claims to Egypt and returned to France. So basically the French got up and left. And of course we have a vacuum in come the British, who rule very differently, as, as we know, uh, in Egypt. Napoleon's proclamations in Egypt, identifying himself with the Prophet and the Mahdi, and affirming that his coming to Egypt was predicted by the Quran, appear two centuries later to be self-serving, cynical, and downright silly. <laughs> now, reading this book by, um, by this eminent uh, professor, Professor uh, uh, Tolan, who's, I think, an American professor uh, teaching history in France. He never uses such language that I, I've read nearly the whole book now. To say something is downright silly sounds a bit, you know, it, it, it's like completely damning. Um, and I think his judgment is uh, quite, quite sober. So the idea that Napoleon should proclaim, identify himself with the prophet, the Mahdi, and think that the Quran was talking about himself, Napoleon, looks to us downright silly. Yet, 
and this is important uh, yet, I think. Now, Napoleon's uh, admiration for the prophet was not merely a product of his Egyptian propaganda. As we see from the memoirs that he and some of his companions wrote years later in exile, because they were captured by the British, on the, wind, the windswept island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic. For it was to this remote island, 1,800 uh, kilometers from the African coast, that the British, having got him, took Napoleon and a few of his men after his surrender in 1815. There, the former emperor, because he came on, he went on to be emperor of France, had ample time to brood on his triumphs and his failures, and also, as we shall see, to reflect on the destiny of a man who had succeeded where he had failed, Mohammed. On St. Helena, on this island, Napoleon also wrote his own memoirs, including an account of his Egyptian campaign. It is here he develops his portrait of Mohammed as a model lawmaker and conqueror. Now, this is the final part, final section of the book I want to read. And here I think we come to a clearer understanding of exactly how uh, uh, Napoleon saw the prophet Mohammed upon whom be peace. Uh, in very ambivalent terms, both admiring him hugely as a general, as a leader, as a lawgiver. But, and I'll leave the but, but I'll let, I'll let uh, our writer explain the but. And that but leads us, I think, to an inexorable, inevitable conclusion about whether or not uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France, believed, was a, was a believer, a Muslim or not. Anyway, we'll come to that in a second. On St. Helena, as I say, Napoleon wrote his memoirs. It is here he develops his portrait of Muhammad as a lawmaker and a conqueror. Muhammad, he explained, banished idolatry in Arabia and, quote, introduced the cult of the God of Abraham, Ishmael, Moses and Jesus Christ, end quote. While Christians were bickering about the composition of the Trinity, Napoleon wrote, Muhammad declared that there was one unique God who had neither father nor son, that the Trinity implied idolatry. And indeed, he wrote on the uh, the cover of his own copy of the Quran. This is in Napoleon's own handwriting. He wrote the following. There is no other God than God. This is very Islamic, of course. And then he wrote the following about the Quran, about Muhammad, I mean. He addressed savage, poor peoples who lacked everything and were very ignorant. Had he spoken to their spirit, they would not have listened to him. In the midst of abundance in Greece, the spiritual pleasures of contemplation were a necessity. But in the midst of the deserts, where the Arabs ceaselessly sighed for a spring of water, for the shade of a palm where he could take refuge from the rays of the burning tropical sun, it was necessary to promise to the chosen as a reward inexhaustible rivers of milk, sweet smelling woods where they could relax in eternal shade in the arms of divine huris with white skin and black eyes. The Bedouins were impassioned by the promise of such an enchanting abode. They exposed themselves to every danger to reach it. They became heroes. Muhammad was a prince. He rallied his compatriots around him. In a few years, his Muslims conquered half the world. They plucked more souls from the false gods, knocked down more idols, raised more pagan temples in 15 years than the followers of Moses and Jesus had in 15 centuries. Muhammad was a great man. End quote. That was all Napoleon's kind of later in life assessment about the prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. And our writer says, uh, Bonaparte's Muhammad is a model statesman and a conqueror. Notice what's missing from that. He's not a prophet. <laughs> um, he knows how to motivate his troops. And as a result, was a far more successful conqueror than Napoleon, holed up on a windswept island in the South Pacific, prisoner, of course, of the British. 
if he had promised sensual delights to his faithful, it is because that is all they understood. His manipulation, far from being cause for scandal, provokes only the admiration of the former emperor. The great man does not worry himself with scruples about tricking the gullible masses. He need only move them, use his eloquence to make them undertake great projects, his projects. Napoleon is ready to excuse, even to praise parts of Muslim law. This is the Sharia. That he had that had been objects of countless polemics, and there's attacks on it by Europeans. Why did Muhammad allow polygamy? First, explains Napoleon, it had always been a common practice in the Orient. Muhammad actually reduced it by allowing each man a maximum of four wives, which is true enough. Moreover, polygamy is an effective tool. And this is where it gets very interesting. When I first read this, I thought, wow, this is very, very contemporary. Polygamy, he argues, this is Napoleon, is an effective tool to combat racism, promoting racial mixing. If a man has several wives, white and black, his sons, and I quote, the black and the white, since they are brothers, sit together at the same table and see each other. Hence, in the Orient, no colour pretends to be superior to another. Next quote. Very interesting. The ex-emperor concludes with a policy recommend recommendation. This is very interesting. When, <coughs> when we will wish in our colonies to give liberty to the blacks and to destroy colour prejudice, the legislator will authorize polygamy, it's actually promoting polygamy as a, as a policy to eradicate racism. Extraordinary. A number of French writers who had been in the, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, Syria and Egypt had remarked that black slaves were treated far better in the Orient than in European and American slave societies. For Napoleon, the particularly Western vice of racism was eradicated in the Orient through the sage legislation of the Muslim prophet. So there's some insight there. And there's the very final last paragraph I'm going to read. And I think this will clinch it, actually. Uh, so the question is, was the emperor Napoleon Bonaparte a Muslim? And I think we can see where this is going, the conclusion. And this last paragraph, for me, clinches it and gives us a very clear answer. And uh, our author, Professor of History, uh, says the following. Not a cloud darkens the radiant image that the fallen emperor paints of the prophet of Islam. In other words, it's all in a very positive portrait. There is none of the ambivalence that we see, for example, in Gibbon. yet. In many ways, he remains an imposter. Bonaparte's Muhammad is the clear author of the Quran and sole legislator. For Bonaparte, his revelations, Muhammad's revelations, are cleverly plotted inventions aimed at stirring his followers and rallying them to a greater cause. Bonaparte's Muhammad is, well, Bonaparte but a far more successful Bonaparte, end quote. That's the end of the book I'm going to read. So what are we to conclude? I think we can reasonably conclude that for Bonaparte, that he had mixed feelings, clearly had huge admiration for the prophet as a great strategist, as a general, as a leader, even as a legislator, a wise legislator. But in terms of the Islamic understanding of the prophet, as someone who was chosen and sent by God um, and also who brought revelation from God, not from himself, of course, he didn't believe that. He didn't believe Muhammad was a prophet of God. Not really at all. He thought the message he brought was from himself. It was Muhammad's own ideas. And indeed, he deceived, you know, because he was such a great man that excused him from deceiving the ignorant masses, particularly the Arab masses. <coughs> and an element of 
um, deprecation and quite racism, actually, ironically, about the Arabs being just basically savages. You could easily be conned by this great man. So I think uh, he wasn't really a, tr a true believer at all, Napoleon. He didn't really believe. He believed that there was no God but God. He was against the Trinity. He accepted a lot of kind of the teaching, I guess. But he didn't believe that Muhammad was sent by God and his revelation came from God. And you've got to believe that to be a Muslim. That's the second part of the Shahada, isn't it? I testify, I bear witness, there is no God worthy of worship but God and that Muhammad, upon whom be peace, was his prophet and messenger. And that really is not something he ever affirmed at all, although he said he was a Muslim. So uh, I think um, when he did say, particularly the Egyptians, that he was a Muslim, uh, I think we are justified in seeing that cynically as a political ploy to somehow win over the Egyptians, who, of course, didn't believe a word of it, I think, um, to justify his, Napoleon's, self-serving political interest in his invasion of a Muslim country. And, of course, he did invade uh, France. They didn't welcome uh, invade uh, Egypt. They didn't want him there. They didn't welcome there. Clearly, there are lots of revolts. The Egyptian people were rising up against him. And this is one of the reasons he left is because the Muslims didn't want this alien foreign guy who was pretending to be a Muslim ruling over them. He clearly wasn't a Muslim. He never, as far as I can see at all, ever said the Shahada. You can't just say, I'm a Muslim. You've got to actually bear witness through uttering the Shahada. That's the first way into, that is the gateway into Islam, is to utter the Shahada. He never did that. So I think we can reasonably conclude um that uh, he was not a muslim ever uh although he had many positive things to say uh about the prophet but that he used uh this idea of being a muslim cynically to grasp power and glory in the colony that he wanted to create in egypt and thank goodness he, he got out pretty quickly although a lot of people died uh, a lot of there was a lot of push back against him and he ruthlessly suppressed that his army suppressed that so he committed many many uh, unjustifiable crimes against the population that he brutally suppressed so uh, i would imagine for many muslims he's not a hero at all but in france he's a very controversial figure i understand still many people admire him and defend him many people don't he's a very very controversial figure but i do recommend this book faces of muhammad western perceptions of the prophet of Islam from the Middle Ages today, a fantastic book, um, and inshallah, I will be, uh, they see praises for the book from um, academics, uh, inshallah, I will be interviewing the author in a month or two, uh, Professor John Tolan, Professor of History at the University of Nantes, and a member of the Academia Europea, he is uh, probably the world's leading expert on this very subject, um, a very readable uh, book. Um, I won't even attempt to review it here. That's a subject for a different uh, broadcast. So um, until then.